Okay, everybody, welcome back to the latest edition of the Old School Cannabis Project. We are fortunate enough to be joined again today by Travis, a.k.a. Native Farming Solutions, a.k.a. Indigenous Creature from Instagram, who joined us briefly in a previous episodes, but he's got so much to knowledge and just amazing information to share with us that he definitely needs at least a minimum of one episode to himself. So welcome again to the show, Travis. Welcome again, Rich, as ever, our co-host and production editor and all that good stuff, Guy. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm going to, it's going to be an easy show for me. I'm literally going to shut up because I just want to be informed as to everything Travis is doing because he does kind of like, I guess, his own work and own version of KNF. And to be honest, while I'm in a situation I'm not always like growing at the moment in the UK or not growing in the UK, and I will be growing next year, I tend to kind of look briefly at what he does and think, yeah, that's fucking cool. And as soon as I'm in a position to apply it, I'll come back and check this post and sort of like re get it in my brain. But at this episode, I'd like Travis to truly kind of break down exactly what he does because he does a lot of cool shit. And I definitely need to learn about it more in depth. So take it away, Travis. Man, all right. Uh, yeah, well, good morning, uh, Blue and uh, Rich. Um, nice, to, nice to uh, make your acquaintance on here. Um, yeah, it's nice to be back on, on a podcast with you, Blue. Um, uh, man, our, our, I guess our, our relationship, our friendship, you know, it's gone a couple of years now. I was um, thinking about that today, bro. It's probably maybe even longer now because I was thinking like one of the few good things about technology, I was thinking like how we met. And I, was, I remember at the time you kind of hitting me up and talking about all the different things to do with corn and like really giving me some in-depth information. I was just remember thinking... Man, this is like one good thing about technology. Here I am getting hit up and being taught all this cool stuff about about corn by native farming solutions. So it's been a while, bro. It's probably been longer, three or three, maybe even four almost years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know what? That's funny. But from day one, you know, you know I've been all about corn and, and, and cannabis. Yeah. Uh yes. Yeah. Uh you know, so we here we are a little bit uh further into it. Um you know, I'm glad to come back on the episode and support uh, support the the cause, support the movement. Um, you know, you know, and, it, and it's a symbiotic relationship. Um, my Instagram uh, presence uh, has always been promoted pretty much by you. Um, uh, you know, I've really I've always tried to be geared towards um, promoting cultivation of indigenous foods. You know, to the indig I've always tried to reach out to the indigenous community, um, uh, and it was few and far in between. Um, you know, but all along, you know, all the while, I thought it was really cool that you were into my posts and my content. And, uh, you know, what I was posting wasn't all entirely cannabis. It wasn't always, um, you know, BSV skunk skunk fam stuff. Um, but you've always, always been a supporter. You know, I've always appreciated that. Uh, so, you know, I'm more than willing to give, uh, contribute back to your cause. You know, uh, there's a lot of people talking nonsense and BS and, Man, it is whatever. I don't even pay attention to that stuff. Um, yeah, we could address that in the future. Honestly, I really wanted this episode purely to be about you, man. Fuck addressing any kind of BS of idiots in the background. My, my show, this this podcast, doesn't always have to be focused on me and my genetics. doesn't even always have to be focused on um, cannabis. I think we might range out into maybe different areas. It's not too far divergent, but other kind of peripheral things. So, yeah, man, what I really want to know is that you do a kind of a version of KNF. You're just trying to, you were just starting to explain before we start to record about what you do at your work and the, the waste diversion aspect of it as well. Because you just seem to do KNF almost on steroids, it looks from what I'm kind of like briefly looking at, at your page and stuff and what you do, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Um, yeah, so, so um, you know, uh, let's see. Prior to cannabis, I was a corn grower. Me and my family um, were Native Americans. And uh, we grow, uh, we took an interest in growing ceremonial foods for our ceremonial community. Um, there weren't very many people doing it. Um, you know, and then in Oklahoma, we, we gave it a shot. Uh, we, we started asking around for seeds. And we come to find out nobody had our traditional seeds in Oklahoma. You know, all the tribes were from other areas. And uh, uh, everybody was in the same boat which was nobody could get our corn to grow in Oklahoma. 
Um, so that, that became a personal a mission of mine was to figure out how to cultivate corn in Oklahoma. Um, you know, uh, uh, cannabis legalized and people always talked about how it grows like corn and tobacco and tomatoes. And, and that was a part of uh, an experiment I wanted to do was compare and contrast how cannabis grows in comparison to corn and tobacco and stuff. Um, but I also wanted to include how uh, uh, corn, you know, you know, corn grown by natives is very different from corn grown by non-natives. Um, and so I wanted to relate cannabis in, in the same way. Um, but anyways, what, what, what happened was, um, you know, here in Oklahoma, we have compact red clay soil. Um, and so uh, it, it took um, a different approach. You know, the seeds that that we grow are accustomed from different regions and accustomed to different types of soil. Um, so I went through a selection process trying to find corn that would grow in compact red clay soil. Uh, and, and along the way, I had stumbled upon KNF. Um, this is when KNF had kind of introduced itself to the world. Um, and it, you know, it introduced itself to the world by way of cannabis. And I always felt uh, that was just because the Koreans wanted to display how effective their system was, that it was uh, uh, useful on even the world's most demanding crops, you know, say cannabis. Um, but anyways, uh, when, when I had uh, started uh, diving into the, the K&F world, um, it didn't take long before I realized it was just uh, food, food preparation and food preservation. Um, and, and for the most part, the system was just based, in, it's just indigenous food preparation and food preservation. Um, so I, I started to interpret KNF a little bit differently um, uh, as, as um, because uh, I'm an herbalist, I guess, uh, and I've always been since a child. Um, so anyways, uh, uh, when I realized what KNF, some of the things that KNF was doing, uh, uh, I, was, I was able to kind of uh, translate and interpret it into my own way, um, into systems that I already had developed and built over the years. Um, so mm -hmm. so uh, we just kind of re, re indigenized KNF. Um, uh, so, so that's what, that's what we, we work on over, uh, that's what I work on in my personal life is, um, the indigenous version of KNF and all it is, is, uh, sustainable farming, gardening, uh, uh, herbalism, um, you know, permaculture is just indigenous living. Um, so, so, so anyways, uh, we, we, we've been working to indigenize, uh, KNF practices, um, <clears throat> And, and so uh, I work as a, a garden program manager um, and uh, we, we, we run a, a waste diversion focused garden. Um, so, so what, uh, uh, what KNF showed me was um, some things about, uh, everyone calls it um, FPJs, FFJs, and then if they have Jodon, they call it Jodon liquid fertilizer. Um, I call all this uh, liquid composting. Um, yeah. and, uh, uh, there's multiple ways for it. And there, there, there's a lot more to it than just like what cannabis knows uh, about liquid composting. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so, so anyways, um, you know, in regards to the system that we've developed, we, 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 I work out of a food bank and, uh, this food bank that I work at is unique because they provide uh, fresh fruits and vegetables aside from just canned, canned goods and prepackaged goods. Uh, the food bank that I work at um, tries to uh, incorporate uh, health veggies and fruits and that's how they developed the uh, garden program. Uh, so I stepped in as the garden program manager. Um, so, so this food bank that I, I work at, they get food from major places like uh, Whole Foods, um, uh, Walmart, you know, big, big, big corporations. Food that doesn't sell there gets sent here. Um, and we redistribute. Yeah. And, and we redistribute some really cool things. Papayas, pineapples, blueberries, strawberries, cranberries, uh, sweet potatoes, potatoes, milk, um, a, a, a plethora of, of seed grains and legumes. Um, um, we offer fresh lettuce, um, juices, uh, it's pretty cool. And, and, and so anyways, what doesn't get picked up in time? Anything that spoil used to go into the dumpster. But now with uh, our, our liquid composting, it gets diverted into the, the garden. Um, okay. And so, uh, so yeah, so, um, so, so I like, I kind of joke around and say that I'm a reverse gardener. I don't teach people how to grow food right now. I teach people how to turn food into soil. Um, and so we have some projects in the garden where, uh, uh, like, we, we have a thousand pounds of, I was given a thousand pounds of potatoes. They said, it's either the dumpster or the garden. What do you want to do with it? Um, 
you know, so so in in the garden we have different experiments. Um, um, I like uh, uh, we have a compost pile, and I like bringing people over to the compost pile and say, "This pile's been here for a couple of years. Um, it's a lot of work. Uh, continue to work this pile, and uh, all winter long we're going to work it. We're going to spray it. We're going to do all these kind of things to it. And then in this in the springtime, you know, we're going to make enough compost to grow, you know, a, a small bed of strawberries. Yeah, um, I was saying that's a lot of work. Uh, and, and so right next to our, our our traditional compost pile, I have barrels full of um, mycelium water and, and lab and, and uh, garden debris um, separated uh, in, in different ways. Um, and I like telling people, uh, go ahead and get in there and turn that compost, work it, you know, get in there and sweat, get in, you know, you're, you're, you're changing the world right there. Um, and, <laughs> and it's going to be a lot of work. I was saying, or we could just fill up these bar barrels with water and put the same amount of debris in these barrels and not have to work it. Um, so the difference being that all that work in that compost pile is going to give us, you know, three cubic feet of compost. Uh, these barrels are going to give us more liquid fertilizer than we can use at our garden alone. Um, so with, with liquid composting, we can fertilize our garden and uh, some of the other neighborhood gardens as well. So can um, you actually make a fertilizer from potatoes? Yes, sir. Yes, you can. Um, so, so, uh, so when we, we, we work with local schools and we work with um, local universities and I have a, a social experiment going on right now. Um, my job is, is to grow food and teach people how to grow food. That's what it is. Um, and, and, and we work with the local schools. So um, I have a social experiment going on where um, college students come to our garden to volunteer. And I, I tell them, my job is to teach kids how to grow food, how to sprout seeds. Um, and so right now, you know, in America, they say that the average 10 year old cannot go outside and identify 10 plants that they see growing on the ground. Um, but they can identify 10 cartoons, um, yeah. 10 candies all day long, you know. And so when telling the university students this, you know, I say, can you guys, you know, list, can you guys identify 10 plants that you see on the ground? You know, and they'll all say no, not unless it has something growing on it. You know, they can't just look at a plant and tell you what it is. Um, and so, uh, uh, so my social experiment is, uh, uh, to teach kids how to grow, grow, uh, food. Um, and the basic, the basis of all of it is, uh, uh, sprouting a seed. Uh, and so I, I have a lesson plan all about seed sprouts. Um, and I like to teach about, uh, food as medicine. And, and right now when, when, te uh, uh, teaching these kids, we focus on seed sprouting seeds, seeds, grains, legumes, and dark leafy greens. Um, because I, I like to teach people that we are in the beginning of the ag agricultural new year and that ag the agriculture new year starts in, in the fall, not the spring, but in the fall. And mm -hmm. in the fall is when we grow seed grains, legumes, and dark leafy greens. Uh, 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 you know, so anyways, when working with these schools, my job is to teach these kids how to grow seed, seed grains, legumes, and dark leafy greens. And I, tell, and I like to tell people that seed grains and legumes and dark leafy greens are unique because they grow through the winter and they provide specific nutrients that help us to prevent from getting sick in the winter. But we don't eat like this. So we just get sick as shit during the winter. Mm -hmm. So I like to reintroduce people to, you know, the agricultural new year begins in the fall and it starts with seed grains, legumes and dark leafy greens. Um, and, and, and so these things grow in the cold. And I think it's really fun to show people like how to grow in the cold. Um, you know, so anyways, my social, back to my social experiment, you know, these are kids that I'm talking to, but how does this apply to university people? How does this apply to business owners? How does this apply to, to elderly folks? Does anybody understand, you know, seed sprouts as, as medicine or, or how the agricultural calendar actually works? Um, you know, are you any smarter than a 10 year old? Um, it, it, we've, it's, we've lost it's, so much knowledge, haven't we? Really, as just yeah, as a group, as as a people, <laughs> as a people. Yeah. Um. So so that's uh, a big thing, like that we promote in my garden: uh, seed greens, the games, dark leafy greens, um, and the agricultural New Year. And I like calling this the uh, Fry Bread New Year, um, because it relates to, um, like I said, uh, fry, uh, winter wheat is a winter cover crop. Um, so anyways, way before all, uh, any, anyone puts a seed or a cut or a clone in the ground in the springtime, you know, the, 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 the agricultural work begins through the winter time. Um, um, and this is, to me, this is decolonizing the mind. 
um, and re-understanding food as medicine. So a part of what I like to teach is that as a society, we've become disconnected with food, medicine, agriculture, and spirituality. Um, and and so quick, I was just thinking, you know, because probably only two, certainly no more than three generations back. Like for example, you know, I know my grandparents and great grandparents were a lot more knowledgeable about you know everything in nature and medicine looking after themselves than generally we are today you know well the average absolutely. person absolutely um so i i talked to high schools and one of the things i like to talk about is food sovereignty and and someone was saying like can you explain that to to these kids what food sovereignty means you know and i try to say that uh, a nation that can't feed itself is very vulnerable you know uh, you have to understand that um and that when talking to high school kids, I'm saying in 20 years, you know, look at the way we're eating now. Look at the condition of food now. You guys live in a food desert. You can't even grow food for yourselves right now. And in 20 years, what, how, you know, what's it going to be like? Um, you know, so food sovereignty is about being able to, to feed yourself. Um, and it's very important that we not lose that ability as, as people. It's just such a fundamental human basic, like it should be a knowledge that we all have because I've been fortunate enough the two main places where I've done my seed breedings and my work have been in two different countries but same similar kind of region a mountain region people who live out in the cities up in the mountains farmers doing their own thing and even in northern Europe I've been I've seen people still they were in their 70s but thankfully still living a way of life that literally if the civilization, as it were, collapsed today, for example, or just on a level, nothing, everything in the shelves of the shops disappeared, they would be okay because they are literally self sufficient for everything except for coffee and toilet paper, you know, <laughs> everything else they produce themselves yeah. meat, dairy, grains, fruit, vegetables everything they had on they, they were so self-sufficient these 70 year old people that were like literally so much more fit physically and mentally as well than most young people 50 years younger than them they could do so much and it was because of the life they lived and the food they ate and that's basically it their food was medicine like you say they did grow a lot of old corn not perhaps uh, yeah, a little different to you but they planted all their own corn they, they 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 harvested the corn they dried it they ground it they made flour they made bread it, everything from scratch everything self-sufficient and it's such an incredible thing to have witnessed and it's so sad that it's nearly gone um yeah uh, i've done some talks and i like i really like promoting knf to non-cannabis people um uh, I've done a couple of talks and, and a lot of times it would be like older folks who would show up, you know, not so many younger folks. And, and I like talking about KNF and I would say, you know, they, they promote it in a funny way, but really these are just simple like food preservation methods um, and things that were practiced, you know, just a couple of generations back by our great grandparents. Um, and I was saying uh, some of the things like the IPM in, in KNF, that's just soap making. That's the basic, that's basic soap making. So when you talk about people who could, fend for themselves you know that's what sovereignty is you know yeah. being able to fend for yourself out in nature out in wherever you live um whether it be an urban setting or rural um and soap is really important um you know so so anyways uh, uh i had caught on to a lot of this stuff just before the pandemic uh, i started to interpret this system for myself just before the pandemic and then when we went through the pandemic and things went crazy um uh, you realize like how fast, like where we live, how fast Oklahoma can deplete, you know, the grocery store aisles. So it's pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and people Three days that, to the end of civilization, bro, literally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And people who lived here in the 70s said they saw something like this when there was a gas shortage. They said they said people were shooting each other at gas at, at the gas station, trying to get gas in the 70s. Like Oklahoma once is wild. Of, once people are out of food for three days, what do you think is going to happen? If there's, if there's yeah. no, food, no, no access to food in, for three days and beyond, obviously, what do you think is going to happen? When I moved, when we moved to our house in the country, I was asking for some advice on getting my well uh, hooked up for um, uh, power during a, a power outage. Um, and I met this one lady and she gave me great advice. But And she said that uh, if you're going to start stocking wood and, and fire and water in Oklahoma, don't let people know. Don't even let your neighbors know. She no. said Oklahoma is prone to to. Uh, you know catastrophe and she said when people run out of wood and and, and water it gets crazy yes. she said yeah she said don't even let your neighbors know um 
And so that's a reality where we live. Um, so we're talking about sovereignty and being able to, to fend for yourself. That's a reality for us. Um, yeah. Oklahoma is really wild. Um, you know, so, so uh, when talking about stuff like this, I like talking about plants and everything. And I like talking about modern uh, cannabis genetics versus old cannabis genetics. And modern cannabis genetics can't thrive in a place like this. They won't, they don't thrive outdoors. They're just like the people. If you take somebody from the city and throw them in the country, they won't mm-hmm. fucking survive. They can get all kinds of shitty, weird funguses and PM or whatever. Um, it's the same thing. Uh, uh, and that's why I've, I've enjoyed uh, Blue's uh, work over the years, because it's some of the only stuff that, that works here. And, and me wanted to, uh, I, I'm focused on growing on the reservations, which is um, other uniquely challenging areas. And I believe that Blue's is going to be some of the best out there. Um, but anyways, um, talking about food sovereignty and, and things like that, um, um, and, uh, you know, old school methods, um, KNF is just uh, uh, homesteading. You know, a lot of homesteading practices from the 50s and 60s um, and, and, and uh, food preservation before uh, refrigeration. Um, JLF and liquid composting, uh, 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 FPJs and FFJs, that's all just uh, food preservation without um, refrigeration. Um, there's multiple ways to go about it. Um, KNF, they, they promote ways that are very expensive. Uh, so as indigenous farmers, we, we promote ways that are... Um, where you can find things where you're at. Um, so I work on the South side, you know, they talk about like lab and sourcing things from your local region. Well, I like talking about lab as um, horchata and I like talking about- lactoacid bacillus for people listening, is that right, yeah? Yeah, yeah, lactic acid bacteria. Um, um, and that's just milk where you put an acid into it and you cause a separation and you get curds. This is just making cheese um, and putting acid in milk is the basis for making buttermilk. Um, and if you want to make uh, fluffier waffles and biscuits and stuff, that's what you do. That's the basics of it. You put a little bit of acid in your milk. Um, um, and, and that's the start of it. Uh, uh, the other version is rice rinse water or just sugar to making hard chocolate. But regardless, you're just letting it ferment for 24 to 36 hours. Um, if you push it past that or you increase the acid, then you begin cheese making. Um, you make cheese and liquid whey. Uh, and the liquid whey is, is, is something awesome. Um, cheese, it, uh, so this whole thing is, you have to have an abundance of milk to make all this happen. Um, um, to get to the lab, um, to get a little bit of cheese. Um, uh, fresh milk is hard to get. Here on the south side, uh, people drink a lot of horchata. And, and, and they make horchata out of what we can get. And what we can get is powdered milk, canned milk, and, and evaporated milk. Um, and on the reservations, it's the same way. We can't get access to fresh foods, but we can get access to a lot of raw ingredients that will make um, superfood. I mean, this just comes back to the understanding of how to prepare raw ingredients, um, you know, such as milk, seed grains, and legumes. Um, um, eggs. <laughs> uh, it, it's just basic food pre- preservation and preparation to me. Um, what would and you IPM... say, you're, sorry to drop, but it just pops into my head. What would you say, like, maybe for people getting into this, what's your sort of like top three homemade KNF style or however you, you, you do your preparation? What's your sort of like your top three, perhaps uh, easy to get into style things you could make like um, lab for example that's the, i've done that with the rice uh, wash that's super easy um what other kind of things are easy for people to get into sort of thing what what methods do you do and by well okay so what what matters to me is horchata and tapache and i always teach um our version of knf they they teach lab and uh uh, uh i don't know what else um but we cover um horchata and tapache um uh, because uh, tapache is a fermented pineapple, but it's actually the fermented pineapple skin. Um, and so uh, the, the pine- pineapple is high in bromelain. Um, pineapple and papayas are used for meat tenderizer, and it has to do with the enzymes that come from bromelains and the papains. Uh, so, so papayas and, and pineapples make some of the best um, meat tenderizer in the world. And some of the best lung medicine, coincidentally, is derived from from pineapples. Um, it's the bromelains, they're, they're beneficial to the lungs. And this is something that I had focused on prior to the pandemic, um, you know, the importance of lung medicine and, and, 
and circulation and things like this. This is uh, wh why tapache was so important to me. Um, so tapache is, is the science of breaking down a pineapple. And I like telling people, how many ways can you use milk? How many ways can you process milk? How many ways can you process a pineapple? Um, you know, and, and so a lot of people just eat a pineapple raw and it burns their mouth. And like, I can only eat so, so much, you know. Well, you're supposed to ferment it. You're supposed to treat it just a little bit and it becomes more medicinal, it becomes more valuable. Um, and one of the ways is uh, fermenting um, the pineapple uh, uh, skins. The pineapple skins have more bromelain than the pineapple itself. The skins in the stock have more bromelain. So you can extract them through a, a sugar extraction. You can, uh, how, how the Mexicans do it is you just put water and a little bit of sugar in the pineapple skins, let it sit for a couple of days, take the pineapple skins, add some more sugar, um, and within a week you have tapache. And what this is, is an antibiotic, probiotic, um, high enzyme uh, solution that is very similar to lab. Um, um, and so this, you get to, uh, you can also tenderize steaks with this. You can uh, uh, drink it and, and clear up your lungs. Um, it has a lot of applications. Um, and I think it's just a better way of using a pineapple than just cutting it and eating it and throwing everything away. Um, Sure. Um, when talking about horchata, I said horchata is the beginning of milk processing, the, uh, uh, and horchata is just adding rice rinse water to to milk, letting it ferment for a little bit. You can add some cinnamon, um, and 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 uh, I make horchata like this. This is how uh, we're supposed. You're not supposed to drink milk raw. It's another thing you're not supposed to drink raw, and if you slightly ferment it, it becomes uh, healthier and more medicinal. Um, you overcome the anti-nutrients and the, the, the negative aspects of it with slight fermentation. And that's just adding a little bit of sugar or water to milk and letting it sit. Um, um, and, and, and so uh, uh, this is the basis of understanding how to eat, you know, drink milk and, 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 and eat a pineapple. Um, if you make your lab and you put your tapache in there, you, have a, you now have a super lab. Um, and I call this super south side lab because this is I've how people on the south side. I've seen you do this a few times, lab. man, where you're combining stuff. And I'm like, well, <laughs> it's getting crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I just love talking about KNF as food, not as fertilizer, because when we talk about composting as fertilizer, people get overwhelmed and get kind of scared. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Make food. Get good at making food. So even if you're not growing cannabis, you can be making fertilizer and perfecting your, your system. And so if you understand the two of, of simple um, tapache and horchata and the third being seed sprouting and if you understand how valuable seed sprouts are as medicine well when you combine these three you now have seed sprout, seed sprout what's known as seed sprout tea or a seed sprouting solution um, this becomes shelf stable and you it's it's one of the most important medicines to feed your young plants but when you realize how medicinal it is you understand how important it is for you to be feeding this to yourself and your kids I think I noticed that, man. You kind of, on your feed, you started, I think, sort of being more plant orientated, and then you started suddenly consuming everything you were making. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I get annoyed when I start seeing, you know, these KNF gardeners who are promoting all these things, and they're like, I wouldn't need it, though. You know, you know it's like, what? Why not? What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> um, and, you know, fraud. You know, I call them, you know, phonies. And, uh, but um, anyways, uh, so, so, yeah, so... You can do a lot with horchata and tapache. One is a milk version and one is a water version, um, a non-dairy. Non um, um, and then seed sprouts, understanding seed sprouts as medicine, you know, trying to figure out how to sprout seeds. Well, the horchata and tapache also help you sprout seeds, you know, add a little bit to your seed soak solution. Um, you know, so anyways, this is um, uh, uh, KNF re-indigenized. Um, and so, so we, are, uh, we operate as Native Farming Solutions, and we operate under a group called IYEP, Indigenous or Indian Youth Empowerment Project. And I like pointing out to people that the word Indian came from Mexico or Puerto Rico. Um, that's what they called the Taino when they saw them, the, the Indios, the people who are always in prayer. Um, so we're Native Farming Solutions, and we umbrella under Indian Youth Empowerment Project. And I just like to remind people that Indians are Mexicans. You know, Mexicans or Indians. Uh, so when talking about indigenizing Korean natural farming, I like promoting horchata and tapache versus lab and whatever other microbe solution they want to call it, you know, um, JMS or whatever. I don't call it that stuff anymore. We call it horchata, tapache, arroz, uh, uh, con dulce, um, um, uh, pescado mole. You know, they call it FAA. We call it pescado mole. Um, um, 
yeah, things they call OHN, we call um, Thai, Thai tea um, used to, to clear up lung congestion. Um, you know, so I think uh, KNF, the way it's taught and the way it's promoted is limiting. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I don't care for the, the purists who, you know, think, you know, I'm wrong for indigenizing KNF. Screw that. Um, no, you seem to have really sort of almost kind of took it and run and made it your own thing and made it better, man. Yeah, and it, I, I feel so too. And so I feel like, you know, KNF was supposed to be shared with the world um, free and be shared freely. Um, uh, but it's not like that no more. Um, uh, so we're kind of like picking it back up and taking it to the south side and say, hey, this is supposed to be for, you know, free for everybody. Um, um, use this. Um, I, but we like indigenizing things and I'm kind of anti uh, uh, English. You know, I believe that the English language is very limiting and very stale and very cheap. Um, and I feel like I would have a more, I would enjoy myself um, reteaching indigenous natural farming in, in Espanol, you know, uh, yeah. or Navajo or Cree, anything else but English. Um, <laughs> uh, English doesn't, doesn't do, doesn't get the job done. Um, you know, so, 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 uh, one of the things that we promote, like I said, we teach non-cannabis people about natural farming methods. Um, and we just call it uh, like, you know, like you're, it's supposed to be applicable to where you live. And if you live in a food desert in, in an urban area, well, now it's called resourceful urban farming. Uh, and the basis of it uh, starts then with um, like home composting and understanding your compostables. Um, so we promote, you know, um, you know, with uh, the mycelium and lab and uh, 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 water in a bucket with with your compostables. So I have at my home, I have a, a coffee grounds bucket and I have a bucket for seed grains and legumes. I have a bucket for dark leafy greens. I have a bucket for um, um, uh, fruits, you know, fruits and vegetables, you know, say tropical fruits. And then another one for um, um, root vegetables like sweet potatoes, beets, you know, and, and, and so forth. Um, and so we promote uh, home home recycling, uh, uh, home home composting in in a proper manner. You know the basis of once you get down your horchata, uh, tapache, and seed sprouts, you can start creating um, uh, buckets full of fertilizer in the garage. Um, and and this can be done through the winter time. Um, this is low smell, um, and this is being resourceful. This is monitoring your waste. This is monitoring what you eat, and you want to eat things that you can compost. Um, and before long, you'll be composting the things that you grow, and it just becomes a closed system. And and so um, this is the basis of our of our program. And and uh, eventually, we have to get into what's called nutrient cycling theory. And this is teaching people how um, plants how plants eat. Um, and then to teach people that we eat like plants, and that we're supposed to eat like plants. The way that plants eat is the way we're supposed. Okay, yeah. So we're talking, uh, um, what, what I was saying about uh, we are supposed to eat like plants, you know, that's something that was revealed to me um, studying uh, nutrient cycling theory um, and how we relate to, to plants. Um, so, so that's uh, a lot of what my uh, work is now is promoting um, food as medicine um, and uh, our, our uh, group, group that we formed, uh, Native Farming Solutions. Um, we are uh, about uh, promoting uh, indigenous uh, cultivation, and we're about uh, recultivating uh, culture by way of uh, cultivation. Um, so I think that's a, a wonderful thing that uh, uh, Korean natural farming has done for the world. Um, uh, yeah. One one thing that uh, me and my friends always talk about when when talking about uh, indigenizing uh, natural farming, uh, it always comes back to um, fire based uh, learning, and it comes back to um, um, how for indigenous people, our our sciences and knowledge comes from our languages, um, and that we are a uh, fire based society, and that everything about uh, my agricultural system revolves around uh, understanding fire. Well, uh, yeah, as far as what can be added, you know, I would just like to say that before I go, you know, I'd like to say, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad that this that. happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know, before I go, but I'm really glad that it happened today because uh, you, you've watched my page. And like I said, uh, I like promoting uh, indigenous concepts of food, medicine, agriculture, and uh, spirituality. 
Um, and and uh, one thing I've come to understand about uh, indigenous cultivation is that we operate in the realm of quantum physics. Um, okay. um, and that uh, uh, science is, is limited and, and science can't keep up with this. Um, and, and, and so uh, uh, astronomy and astrology is included in, in our system uh, and spirituality is included in our system. So I had talked about how the indigenous system is fire-based and language-based. Yeah, um, that's right. You're going, you're going down yeah. that direction of fire. Yeah, yeah. And I like to talk, talk about language-based because we're a language-based society and, and we believe that our languages are alive. We believe that our languages have spirits. Sure. Um, we believe that with our languages, we could talk to the stars um, right. and and uh, scientists and, you know, people would say like, well, that's just silly that, you know, that's theory. That's, quant you know, quantum physics or quantum theory. That's not, you know, applicable in real world application. But anyways, that's where we exist. You know, that's our existence is, is in what's, you know, like un almost unreal. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I love uh, growing corn and I love growing uh, uh, your beans blue. Um, people don't believe what I, what, what I tell them about these beans and I don't care. <laughs> they probably don't believe me anything I tell them about American history or astronomy or astrology. It doesn't matter. Um, it's uh, lost, so I'm, honestly. Yeah. So I'm, a pre I, I'm appreci appreciative of you, of you as a friend, Blue. Um, for these past few years and i'm grateful that we were able to do this today is uh, uh winter solstice uh okay. sh shortest day of the, so the is, year yeah, i just looked it is you're right 21st the, the day we're recording we're, is solstice 21st of december that's true man yeah we this is the furthest we're from the sun uh, you know and so my birthday is june 20th uh, uh summer solstice nice uh so so i'm i'm, I'm you know you know i'm big into um all this the stars and plants and and, and agriculture. Um, and I look forward to seeing what your beans are going to do uh, uh, do with, with me and my group, you know, in these next couple of years. Um, well, you've done a lot of, lot of nice work with them. So what do you think you'll be growing this season in terms of the cannabis that you've, you've, you've made? Well, seeds? geez, it's so hard. I have, I'm so limited. I don't have enough space, time, and hands. Well, tell, and me energy. tell me about Gee, it. Gee whiz. So I have to be, you know, it takes forever, you know, which one, which ones am I going to run with, um, you know? And so I've, I, I've kind of broken down your, your beans. I've, I've grown everything from Turb Town, Boss Pack, um, I, the uh, Strawberry Chorus, Pineapple Field, Cherry Chorus, Skunk Haze, and then up into the S-Line 3 and S-Line 1 category. You've grown um, everything. <laughs> yeah, I've kind of figured out what I like. Um, and... Uh, Man, this next run, I believe, is going to be my strawberry run. The strawberry corpse line was the most fascinating, most intriguing, uh, my favorites, um, the ones that I just love. Um, and so in, in, in my categories, I've categorized uh, strawberry corpse, pineapple field, and cherry cola skunk haze as three um, isolates um, yep. separate from the rest. Um, and I call, I call my line tres flores, the three flowers. Nice. Um, and I'm currently working on a uh, ferment for them, a blue fer uh, uh, bloom ferment, which is blueberries, blackberries, and strawberries. Uh, <laughs> oh, man, you're, yeah, that's genius. <laughs> uh, so anyways, I'm working, yeah, I'm working the uh, strawberry, pineapple, and cherry cola lines um, for myself this year. Um, I can work them either towards indica or towards sativa. Um, and so when I push things towards... Uh, include the S lines, you know, I consider the three to kind of give me the indica direction and the one to give me the sativa direction. And when pushing for the sativa direction, I kind of feel like it's um, a tribute to old timer one. You know, that's what he would have done. You know, that's the way he would have gone. And even though I'm not a sativa guy, I'm very curious as to what will be produced from, you know, working the sativa phenos out of. Yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to like unleashing some extreme sativa uh, genetics from that whole gene pool. It's one of the things I'm going to be looking to isolate when I pop the seeds that I'm going to in South Africa, uh, probably around about beginning of February, all, all things going to plan. Um, but yeah, I want to pull out, I also want to look for some, you know, some refined skunk lines, but some serious sativas I would like to um, like to work out to, some nice hazes. Obviously, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but it is the cup of tea of some people. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'd definitely like to make those available. Um, some like the extreme outlier hazes, the super long ones that are like six months flower. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> yeah. <quite cool laughs> to bring out. 
Uh, but trying to keep the the highs that are sativa in the you know traditionally what's the vibe to sativa, but without any of paranoia because I do remember that like, one kind of sixteen week sativa, one most extreme. But I do remember the sixteen weeker that I grew from old time one stuff, and I tell you it was horrible in that it was. It was just severely paranoia inducing. And I always used to think and still do believe <laughs> to a large extent that a lot of the so called anxiety and paranoia people experience is often down to their situation, it being an, an illegal uh, environment and stuff, you know, particularly in the past, not so much now perhaps, but in the past, mm-hmm. certainly I think people got the got the jitters or whatever from the fact they might think they're getting nicked or bust, you know. But anyway, um, there was one one plant that I have experienced in old time, and I was not in a situation or uh, environment where I needed to be afraid I was going to be bust or anything like that. You know, it was a very secure environment, but it was just still horribly paranoia and inducing. Just made you feel on edge, anxious, just horrible. So I try and avoid those and you know deselect any sativas like that. But on the flip side, there was some extreme sativas that are. Uh, uh, pleasant, do you know what I mean? They give you that energy and that um, rush of vitality, or most you know the opposite of an indica. Uh, no lethargy, but make you want to work out and do some exercise, but maintain like the the, the calming, pleasant aspect as well. No, no paranoia, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the extreme sativas are definitely coming next year. <laughs> right, that's cool, um, man. I'm gonna have to get going here, um, but uh, I was, I'm glad we were able to chop it up this morning. Yeah, well, thanks, man. I'm hoping this will be like the first of, as I say, multiple shows where you come back and share your knowledge with us, man. Perhaps go into depth a little more, or lay out the step by step methods of producing a couple or three of these things, the whole charter and the labs, etc. That'd be cool for people who've never done it before. And uh, yeah, definitely come on next year as we watch your outdoor progress. That, you don't, I don't think I've actually ever seen you grow indoors. Is that, do you do any I, indoor grow, bro? Hardly. Um, and I'm not like just a cannabis grower. I usually have like a hundred things going on at once. So I don't know. Yeah, Sometimes people check ask out me. your your socials, man. Your Instagram is native farm because you changed it. Do you want to give the exact uh, thing? So I definitely encourage everyone to check out your page because it is so interesting man <laughs> you won't, you won't find this information anywhere else i don't understand it's fucked up people follow this guy man how the fuck i see some some fucking accounts blow up crazy fast yeah yours is kind of slow and steady but it's one of the best on instagram <laughs> it's more yeah. Than man uh, well, yeah uh, sometimes i just man i can't stand the cannabis community dang it <laughs> they, you know, sometimes they just want to get out of my page and just raise hell. I can't stand them. I try to avoid them. Um, but anyways, it's an indigenous creature NF for natural farming. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, my public page is uh, Black Soul OKC, uh, uh, SOL, Black Soul. Um, that's our uh, nutrient line that we're developing. Um, and uh, we'll be also be displaying some of the... Uh, so you're going to have a nutrient line available for sale, yeah? For anybody listening who wanted to try out your... your uh, uh, yes. You could actually retail to public, yeah? Yes. Awesome. Um, Is that, well, how far from doing that are you at the moment? How far from, like, uh, release, as it were, are you? Jeez, we just... Um, we just need to pay 15 bucks and get our uh, paperwork filed. Um, we have things bottled up and ready to go. I'll oh, do it, man. Get that to make some labels because I think people there. are going to be definitely interested. I know if I was anywhere nearby, I would be buying them. Yeah, my, uh, Black Soul is my uh, dinosaur juice line. Um, game changer. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. I, I look forward to promoting some more of that. Well, come um, back on another episode, bro, in the future, and tell us about your nutrient line that you're going to have available to public because I for sure would buy it. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, we'll have some... Uh, uh, Nutrients available, that's Black Soul, S-O-L, O-K-C. Um, and then uh, NFS, uh, Native Farming Solutions, um, is our uh, nonprofit page uh, for public education for uh, uh, resourceful urban farming. Send the links over to Rich, and we'll get them put in the description box properly so people can just click on them and find you, bro. Okay. Yeah, 100%. All right, cool. All right, awesome. Thanks for joining us, man. Come back anytime. 
and thank you to everybody listening. It's the end of today's episode. All right. Have a good one, y'all. I'll see you. Take care, man.